So good afternoon. Um, now um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Lok Yu from Division of Physics and Applied Physics of NTU. So I'm the chair for this session. Um, so we are very pleased to have um, Professor Elena Payne to give the talk on Kelonove, the boundaries of heavy elements. So let's welcome Elena. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for having me here. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here and uh, to be part of this uh, inspiring conference where we also remember our eclectic friend and colleague, uh, Neil Gerels. Um, so uh, we, I will expand, I will keep, my talk will be uh, still on the event, on the gravitational event of summer last year. Um, a lot of material has already been presented, so I will elaborate in particular on the multi-wavelength electromagnetic counterpart. Uh, we know very well that the business is very simple. These mergers, these double neutron star mergers, uh, have three predictable outcomes. Um, a gravitational signal in uh, the one to one, one hertz to one kilohertz range, which is near approximately isotropic, not completely, but approximately uh, isotropic. A short gamma ray burst, which is thought to be highly anisotropic, and I will comment on this. Uh, that, that, that will be, in fact, a, an important part of my talk. And uh, our process nucleosynthesis, a rad radioactive uh, uh, counterpart, an opt uh, um, a source of radioactive nature peaking in the optical infrared, which is also uh, fairly, not completely, but fairly isotropic. So the prediction that uh, a double neutron star merger should be accompanied by a short gamma ray burst uh, dates back many years, almost 30 years. It has been made uh, uh, notably by the uh, 89 article by Eichler, Livio, Piran, and Schramm. And uh, uh, ever since we've been uh, uh, noticing the difference between long and short gamma ray bursts, which is not, not limited to the duration, it reflects on the spectral hardness. They are significantly different in spectrum. Ever since we've known this, it was evident that they should come from two different populations, two different uh, progenitors. For 20 years, we've been knowing that long gamma ray bursts are produced by supernovae, by the uh, collapse of a massive stellar core. Short gamma ray bursts have been suspected, highly suspected for a long time, of being produced by uh, mergers without a proof so far until summer uh, last year. And the uh, uh, radioactive counterpart, expected counterpart, is uh, dominated by our process, rapid neutron capture, nucleosynthesis, uh, meaning the energies, the densities uh, uh, of the energies and of neut neutrons in these uh, very small, very compact volumes sources are so high that all of the elements of atomic weight higher than uh, iron should be, should be formed. You see here a, a, a synoptic view of the periodic uh, table of elements where the for all elements are color coded according to their uh, formation site. Um, a first evidence of our process nucleosynthesis of kilonova was claimed, uh, uh, was found five years ago uh, when uh, this relatively close by short gamma ray burst was followed up at all wavelengths. Its afterglow was followed up in X-rays, optical, infrared. And the infrared uh, uh, HST observations returned the detection one single photometric point uh, in the infrared that was above the extrapolation of what was expected from the simple infrared afterglow decay. And that was claimed, that was thought to be uh, evidence of kilonova. Of course, it was not very uh, uh, strong. It was not firm, especially because no spectral confirmation uh, had been possible back then. There is no spectrum of this uh, infrared source. Uh, but it was generally broadly consistent with uh, kilonova, with our process uh, in a neutron star merger coming from uh, uh, nucleosynthesis in a mass that was between one hundredth and one tenth of a solar mass, so a rather broad mass range. We did much better uh, with, the, uh, with the event last, uh, last summer. So this uh, uh, view graph shows the, summarizes the uh, LIGO events 
and highlights the two LIGO Virgo events uh, last summer, where you can see the uh, precision of, uh, of, of localization is much better, obviously, when, when Virgo was, was present. The, the, the two events in August 2017 have been localized to these uh, rather relatively small banana-like error boxes that are still big, but, but sufficiently small that, that um, an electromagnetic search was, could be uh, successful, as we, as we know. And this is the uh, short gamma ray burst that has been already shown by uh, previous, many previous speakers, detected both by the Fermi GBM and by the uh, anti-coincidence system on board the integral satellite. Um, the winning technique in the search of these error boxes resulted to be, uh, turned out to be a targeted search. It's not a blind, uniform, tiled search of the error box. But what has been adopted, the technique that has been adopted is rather um, targeting of the galaxies, of, of host, potential host galaxies, weighted according to their probability of hosting an event, which means, roughly speaking, their luminosity. So a bigger weight in the uh, um, uh, tile in the, in the uh, search technique has been given to more massive and more luminous host galaxies within the uh, uh, cosmic volume suggested by the interferometers. And this technique has been uh, uh, adopted and uh, used to its perfection, in fact, because the result was uh, uh, incredibly uh, bright and quick. And one of the first people to champion this uh, uh, um, technique, this strategy, was Neil Gerels himself. One of the last papers written by Neil Gerels in 2016 dealt exactly with this problem. Of course, he was aiming at adopting a targeted search uh, with SWIFT, obviously. He was looking for a best, for an optimal strategy to use uh, instruments optical X-ray and multi-wavelength instruments with a small field of view for the search. And obviously, his primary interest was SWIFT. And as a matter of fact, uh, it was a winning one. It was very successful. This is the, uh, the banana uh, uh, error box of the event with different colors uh, 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 representing different probabilities. The small dots are the uh, galaxies within the, the galaxies within 50 megaparsecs uh, within the error box, and the squares are the sizes of the. It's the size represents the size of the Swope one meter telescope. It's, it's a few square degrees, the typical size of a small uh, searching camera. Uh, as I said before, the error box is not is is big, but not huge, not tremendously big. It's 20, 28 square degrees. Which, uh, which is daunting. It, it will be daunting for a gamma ray burst, because gamma ray bursts are cosmological. So it's still very difficult to find counterparts of gamma ray bursts in 28 square degrees. But this one was, was, was a close one. It's, this gravitational uh, wave source was radically different uh, in philosophy. The search was radically different from a gamma ray burst, because this is so close by. That's, that made the whole difference, in fact. And, uh, here you see the, uh, the comparison of the pre-explosion uh, image with the uh, image in August 2017, as seen by the uh, SWOPE uh, one meter telescope, where you see the uh, bright source, uh, previously inexistent bright source, located at about 10 arc seconds away from the nucleus of a spheroidal uh, galaxy, NGC 4993, at 440, merely 40 megaparsecs. This is a description, a little bit more detailed description of the environment of this object. These are HST uh, images. This is HST in optical and infrared. Uh, the particularly interesting one is this uh, uh, right bottom one, because it, in this, on this HST image of the host galaxy is overplotted the um, contours obtained with a ground-based telescope, with the VLT, and the MUSE uh, integral field unit uh, spectrograph that shows a very nice uh, uh, spiral, barred spiral structure <coughs> crossing across the, um, the lenticular, the apparently lenticular 
continuum of this galaxy. This galaxy, in fact, is far from being a regular, normal, quiet galaxy. It, you can see it by eye, and this uh, uh, spiral structure confirms it. It's a quite disturbed one. It, 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 it shows signs of a particularly uh, um, turbulent uh, uh, environment. And of course, the question is, can this, be, can this element be correlated uh, uh, in any way with the probability, with the fact that an event, uh, a merger, a binary neutron star uh, uh, system was formed and, and uh, uh, merged. So these are the light curves, the optical and infrared light curves of, of the counterpart. It has already been noted how much faster it decays in optical. And this is the, the whole point, the very fast decline of these sources. They can start rather bright, which is what uh, allowed detection of the source, but then they decay quite fast. The, this is the, the Kilonov, this is from a paper by uh, Iair Arkavi, so it is likely that he will bring this up again, uh, which is a very important point. When you compare this object, the luminosity and decay of this object, the light curve, with uh, other types of very common types of transients, like type 1a supernovae, core collapse supernovae, this kilonova is quite dim in comparison, uh, less luminous and especially and extremely fast, extremely rapid. So uh, this answers the questions of those who say, who say, can we have missed these objects? Since we have now so detailed optical surveys, uh, and in, in optical and infrared uh, surveys, could we detect these objects serendipitously? And the answer is, it's very hard. It's very difficult, because these objects are very elusive, as you, as you can see. So uh, before going to in, into details, into showing the, uh, the spectra we, our collaboration has obtained with the VLT, I would like to pause a minute on the spectra of the competition. These are from Magellan, the Magellan Telescope. And, uh, this is only the optical. There is no infrared, which, as we know, was a crucial uh, component, was a, a crucial observable. However, these people are the only ones who managed to take spectra the very first night of the photometric detection of the transient. The first spectra up there in the sequence have been taken less than one day, uh, at 0.5 days. It's, it was the same night as the uh, detection of the transient. Uh, is it important? It's crucial. As you can see here on the right, uh, those two spectra, unfortunately, don't go very much into the blue. So uh, they had to model them. And the model with a pure black body suggests a very high initial temperature uh, of the order or higher than 10,000 Kelvin. So uh, it is extremely important. And this sets, obviously, a constraint on the, uh, on the radius, on the photospheric radius. So the name of the game here is uh, quickness. And this is our spectra. This is our sequence. Um, the, by the way, I, I, I don't want to take the complete merit of, of the <laughs> acquisition of this spectra. <coughs> this is the result of work done by a, large, uh, a rather large collaboration of which at least two, people, uh, two more people are in this room, Paolo Mazzali and Chris Acuveliotu. And uh, it paid off uh, to be uh, so many people and so well organized. So the, the, the most important point here is that this instrument allows us, allowed us to take spectra from simultaneously from the near UV to the uh, near infrared. And so the initial one is still a black body. One day after the Magellan ones, we still saw a, an almost perfect uh, black body. The temperature is lower. And uh, the esti our estimate of the uh, um, expansion velocity here is, is quite high, 20% of the velocity of light. Uh, later on, uh, obviously, the ejecta are becoming transparent. And the, the, um, there are many uh, atomic species uh, emerging. The, there are broad, a number of uh, broad absorption features uh, uh, observable on the, on the spectra. So the spectrum deviates more and more from a, 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 an opaque source, from a black body. Um, and the velocity goes down, declines. The whole point here is identifying the atomic species. 
uh, and, and here is where the new job, all of the uh, difficulty and new uh, field is uh, coming up. Why this is completely different from supernovae, the, the type of source is exactly the same. We have a radioactive source that is becoming transparent. There are atomic species recognizable in the ejecta. We want to identify them to learn, to measure the abundances, uh, to know uh, what these chemical elements are. While in supernovae, we can do this job after now many, many years of experience, decades of experience, this job can be done to incredible accuracy. You can uh, identify atomic species in supernovae quite uh, uh, easily, quite straightforwardly compared to this. Uh, here, it's not, not yet possible. This is exactly, this is the frontier of the research giving a name, giving a description, a chemical description of what, uh, of the spectral, spectroscopic patterns we observe. And the point is that the velocities are so high that these features not only are blue shifted, but they are stretched and they blend with each other. That's, that's the whole point. So at face value, a, a simple analysis, a simple description, even quantitative, a simple description of the spectrum itself, if you only have the spectrum, is not possible. It's not getting you very far. You need a model. So uh, um, we've seen this uh, before in uh, uh, Masaru Shibata-san talk. The, the, there, are, there may be more than one component in this source. And the reason is that if you try to model kilonova spectra with one single component, you are having a very hard time. The problem is that there is a very strong macroscopic spectral change. This object reddens at very high speed, a very high rate. So the, the blue component and the red component are behaving differently. That's why you want to have at least, to model it at least with two components that may be geometrically uh, distinct we don't know yet in detail how distinct they are. In this picture, they are shown to be, a, there is a dynamical ejecta component, the, the first one, the prompt one, which is produced by tidal uh, uh, disruption, shock, uh, shock interaction. That's developing more equatorially, so to speak. And then there is another one more related to neutrino viscosity. Uh, neutrino heating, perhaps more polarly directed. The model we have applied doesn't distinguish, doesn't make, from a numerical point of view, this geometrical distinction, this the geometrical separation. We are not yet there. We, are, we, we don't have the tools yet to do that. Uh, what we have, what we ass assumed, the assumption is that the dynamical ejecta have a low YE, a low number of, uh, a low fraction of electrons or protons, which is the same. What does that mean? That the neutron fraction dominates. Therefore, you have the so-called lanthanides. Your elements are more, your, your, your ejecta are more lanthanide rich, meaning they have a high opacity. That's why you need this component. You need a component that is opaque enough to depress the optical and make a bright infrared component, which is what you see, which is what you observe. You have a bright infrared component. If, you're, if you only use this dynamical ejecta component, you produce a, a lanthanide, you have a lanthanide rich medium, you produce a lot of infrared luminosity, but you depress the blue. You depress the blue component. And therefore, you can't describe this initial very bright blue component. That's why you need to add a high YE component that dominates in the blue. That's the whole point that of having two emitting regions. Either you have one that is extremely bright and accounts for the infrared, but then it's too bright in the, in the blue. Or you have a very blue one 
and you try to reproduce it with lanthanides, but then you overproduce the infrared because lanthanides have a very high opacity. So the whole point is trying to reproduce blue and, and red together simultaneously and to reproduce this huge, very rapid uh, blue decrease. So you need lanthanide rich to make the infrared component and lanthanide free to make the blue component. That's, that's the whole point of having two, two components. We even have three here. That's, that, that's a, uh, um, <coughs> dictated by little details of, of the model, of trying to reproduce the data as best as we can. Of course, if you increase the number of components, then you also increase the number of parameters and it is easier. Modeling is, is easier in a sense, but, that, but it becomes also more physically complicated. So this is the uh, nuclear, various examples of nuclear reaction networks. This has already been shown by uh, Shibata-san. In black, you have the solar one. So you have in the center here the lanthanides. By playing with your YE, with your electron fraction, you can determine the abundances. You can optimize the abundances you need to reproduce your, your components as a, as a function of time. This is what we have tried to do with our spectrum. So this is the first spectrum. Uh, the red line here, the Borgundy line, is the convolution of the three models. In black is the spectrum, the observation. In red is the model that comes from summing the three component models, the three different compo geometrical component models. Blue and green, lanthanide free or lanthanide poor, and orange, lanthanide rich. And we do a relatively good job here. Uh, it becomes worse and worse uh, as time goes by. And the reason is we don't know precisely, we don't know exactly the opacities of these elements. So th my guess is here that we are probably quite correct in thinking that we have more than one component. We have guessed uh, fairly correctly, decently, the nuclear reaction network, but we don't know the opacities. We have our, our uh, 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 progress should aim, should be focused on improving the opacities. Because as you see, the continuum, the, the red continuum is systematically above the black spectrum, the observed black spectrum. So we have to work on our opacities. So this is a summary. I will say a few words now on the on the jet, on the, on the um, gamma ray burst associated component. This is a, a view graph, uh, a unified scheme, so to speak. Uh, it's a view graph that shows uh, what happens. You have what happens to your object as a function of viewing angle. What we think is that there is a, 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 a kilonova component, the red and the blue components. A gamma ray burst that develops into a relativistic jet along the uh, symmetry axis, depending on where you are located, on where your, where your viewing angle is, you will observe different things. The kilonova, you will see more or less the same uh, wherever you are, because it's nearly isotropic. Maybe <coughs> if you are at 90 degrees with respect to the symmetry axis, you don't see the neutrino uh, uh, heating component, the, 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 so the, blue, the blue component, the post-merger ejector, or you see a depressed, uh, a depressed component. What should change very much is the jet, because the jet is highly directional. It's ultra, we think it's ultra, our knowledge of gamma, cosmological gamma ray bursts is the, that we have an ultra relativistic jet that produces a, 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 very, a very energetic signal followed by an aftermath, by an afterglow. If you are directed at very small angle with respect to the jet axis, this is what here on the uh, top right is in black is what you expect to see a monotonically declining afterglow. If you are directed differently, you will see different things. At 90 degrees, you shouldn't be able to see anything in principle. If you are at an intermediate angle, you should be able to see a component that doesn't start, it's not bright at the beginning and rises and declines. So 
So at the beginning, people were thinking that this was the textbook event that allowed, would allow us to reconstruct, to prove the unifying scenario, to see the unbeamed component of the gamma ray burst. We are no longer, we have already seen that we are no longer so sure about it, because as a matter of fact, it, turn, it turns out much more difficult to describe, to characterize this blast wave, be it jet or sphere, than we thought. I will show it in a minute. So this is the same as uh, uh, Michael Briggs has shown before. The format is a little bit different, but the substance is exactly the same. Uh, this object, this, this is the prompt uh, gamma rays from the gamma ray burst. The isotropic and the gamma ray energy as a function of redshift compared with uh, other, a number of long and short gamma ray bursts. This object, our object here, our, our friend, is, is extremely uh, weak, uh, extremely underluminous, which was at the beginning thought to be evidence that this is unbeamed. So we see the intrinsic unbeamed gamma ray burst source, gamma ray source. Well, if we look at the, at the, at the aftermath of this uh, uh, object, so on the left you have the optical light curves. So at the beginning, you have the, the optical kilonova here uh, declining very quickly. There are HST observations taken a few months after the explosion here. There are a couple of infrared upper limits and an optical detection with HST. This clearly is not kilonova. This falls many orders of magnitude above the, uh, the extrapolation of the kilonova light curves. So this is clearly a different component. And the idea is that this is the afterglow. The, the gamma ray burst afterglow. So on the right here, these same points are compared with radio and x-rays. And as you see, that they have been ri radio and x-rays have been rising, just like the optical. So is this telling us something about the jet, about the, about the, behavior, the, the behavior of this source? Well, the model, the model curves here, are from a structured off-axis jet. Structure means it's not uniform. It's not a cone. Structure means that, uh, roughly speaking, the Lorentz factor of the plasma decreases as a function of the angle, of the angular distance of the velocity vector, meaning the more, the bigger the angle the plasma particles are making in their uh, motion, the lower is their Lorentz factor. That's a structured jet. If you take a structured jet at 20, 30 degrees, with a viewing angle of 20, 30 degrees, you compute the light curves, this is what you get. Is this it? Well, at the moment we don't know because it looks like, so you hit, see the structured jet in blue here, you see the isotropic, a purely spherical expansion in red, and you see they are both very good uh, descriptions. <coughs> what seems to fail, what we seem to be able to exclude at this point is the green curve, which is a uniform jet, meaning a, a simple, like a simple rigid uh, jet, rigid cone seen off axis. That doesn't seem to fit the data very well. So we are, perhaps we are in a position to exclude that. But between structure jet and pure sphere, purely isotropic expansion, we are not yet in a position to tell. If we can get more observations, if there are more data coming, especially in radio, this is a, a radio light curve, uh, the two models conveniently diverge. Therefore, if we can det still detect the source, and we should because the source if it was detected here, it should be detected also later on if either of these descriptions are correct. And we should be able to tell structure jet uh, from sphere, from purely isotropic expansion. So my conclusions. We've detected a double neutron star merger and our process nucleosynthesis uh, unambiguously. Um, I'm not sure, I'm much less optimistic than I used to be on the unified uh, scheme, on having prov proven the unified scheme for short gamma reverse, but there are good reasons to hope that it's 
we have, uh, we have a chance to test it. Um, we must work uh, on the, the models, the Kilonova models uh, we have in hand uh, are giving decent results. I think we are on the right track. Uh, we have to make a lot of work on uh, abundances, but especially on opacities. I would like to drop a word of caveat on all of the identifications that have been proposed so far. You will go through the literature and you will see there has been claims, there have been claims of cesium, tellurium, uh, strontium, yttrium identified in the spectra. I would be wary. I don't think those identifications are firm. And uh, um, with statistics, uh, with, if we can, if we will be able to build on uh, statistics, we've been hearing uh, about rates in talks, in previous talks. It's not very optimistic. I mean, the, the numbers will be, will be small. So the progress <laughs> will be late, will be uh, uh, slow. Uh, I'm, I'm not particularly uh, intimidated by this. Because I come from a, I come from the field of uh, supernova gamma ray bursts. I, I was working, I'm still working on uh, identification of supernovae associated with low redshift gamma ray bursts, which is something that happens every two three years. Low redshift meaning lower than 0.2. So I'm used to uh, uh, low pace uh, progress, so, uh, and it looks like with gravitational waves it may be the same, especially if we want events like this one. It's not, it, the, the, the false alarm rate of this event was one in 80,000 years. It's extremely lucky. It was an extremely good event. If we can build up on, on statistics, if we can get uh, uh, enough data of this kind, we will be finally able to say something, to, to, to set some quantitative constraints on equation of state, finally, on equation of state of neutron stars, um, a major unknown. Especially because what are our uh, uh, best observables, best uh, hints, best guesses? There are two particularly important. If we can build statistics, we can address this uh, with, with some seriousness. And one is the ejecta mass depends on, as on mass asymmetry. It's, it goes up with mass differences in the, in the uh, compact star merger. In fact, if one of the components is a black hole, the ejecta mass should be maximum. So it goes up with mass difference. And the other thing is ejecta mass goes up with softness. The softer the equation of state, of state the higher the ejecta mass. So these two uh, elements should be statistically very uh, uh, informative. So I, with this, I can only wish to every one of us a good start of uh, observing run number three. Thank you. So any questions for Elena? Elena, <laughs> okay. uh, um, it's May also be Vishabhata san. Um, hi. Uh, Sorry, uh, I'm still trying to get my head around the dynamics of what's being proposed here. I think what would help is to understand in, in the models and in your idealizations what you think is the highest temperature the neutron star matter comes to during this interaction where it merges, neutrino cools, and so on. So what? is the highest temperature that it actually achieves? Well, I, I don't have it with me, but I, I have it somewhere. I can show it uh, uh, offline. There, there is a, a very nice, uh, but I'm sure uh, Shibata Sun has them as well. I have, I refer to a simulation by uh, Stefan Rosfog, and he has uh, like one to 10 MeV. The, the, the hottest regions here are one to 10 MeV. Yeah, 10, the, ten, ten to 20 MeV, yes, yes. yes. Many, many de tens of MeV. Well, it's tens of MeV. Yes. Uh, I'm, just trying, I'm just trying to get up to 0.4 and 0.6 C. Just from that hot, hot <coughs> gas, that's all. If it's, you know, it's less than 10 MeV and you've got to get up to these half 
RFC speeds, that seems to be a bit of a challenge. Right. Um, yeah, you need some uh, shock breaks out from uh, merging to neutron stars, and some small fraction will be accelerated in this uh, shock breakout. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question. Oh. Can, can I ask okay. a question? Uh, as you showed, uh, you have a beautiful uh, black body like spectrum of the early. One day is 1.5 days, yes. But in your model, you have three components. And that uh, com compose this beautiful uh, single power law. You, couldn't you find a single uh, component to explain this uh, early? If, if you read, if you read uh, Masaomi Tanaka's paper, uh, um, you could marginally, marginally do a fair job with a, um, YE with a fraction, YE fraction of 0.25, and do everything with that. It's not optimal. And mm -hmm. I have another question. So later time, what you see is a photosphere inside and inside, and then you see slower and slower material. And maybe your line structures will be more uh, beautiful. Sure. And uh, the, this event specifically, the latest, the last spectrum you get was uh, because of the faintness or the location. Yeah, the, the, these are normal. These are all uh, uh, consistent with one another. It's after spectrum number four or five. So, uh, beginning at 4.5, 5.5 days after explosion, as you see, they, they are quite, quite low. The continuum is quite fainter, and the and you have to think this object started with magnitude 17, visual magnitude 17. Five days later, we are already at the level of 20, 21. Let, let, me, let me give you, OK, you have it here. You, you, look, you look on the, la on the left. 10 days later, it has already dropped five, six magnitudes. It's, it's very, these, these objects are very rapid, very fast. Yes, it is difficult, yes, it is difficult. Very difficult science. Next question. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, a, rem a remark uh, concerning the question by Roger earlier. Um, when the jet propagates through this ejector, uh, it produces a shock wave and a cocoon, and this cocoon could uh, actually dissociate some of the material. And this would also have an influence on the YE of the material. So the final observed YE, or final observed uh, composition, may be dependent not just on what was ejected from the Newton star mergers themselves, but also on what happened between the ejection and the time of the observation, uh, which is uh, in the first few seconds when the jet propagates it may go, get out or may not get out. It doesn't matter, but it injects a lot of energy in, into a shock wave. And this shock wave is powerful enough to change the nuclear composition. So we may get something else by a totally different uh, mechanism. Uh, uh, we, had this pro we had this problem with supernova gamma reverse as, as well. We, we know what you are saying, what you are talking about, is a known problem for long gamma rivers as well. We've always been asking ourselves how much of, of the, spectro the spectroscopic pattern we observe, how much is due to a mildly relativistic component due to the, to the jet. I don't know. Uh, uh, we, we usually said, we used to say, the jet intersects only a small solid angle, so it cannot make too much damage. But it's, in, it's not necessarily true. In this case, the, the jet may be 4 pi. No, so the, jet, the jet is very narrow angle, but the cocoon that the jet produces yeah. is very wide yeah. angle. Yes, absolutely. And so this is one difference. And the second difference, that in the material that, that is produced in a regular supernova, this is usually near the nuclear uh, minimum 
where the nuclear energy is minimal and you cannot, ex can, it's difficult to, to change it. But here you are talking about uh, elements which are, which has very high uh, atomic number. Yeah. And these elements are much more fragile, so it's much more easy, it's much easier to dissociate them. It's absolutely, absolutely true. Yes, absolutely true. I hope one possibility, one hope is that um, with this decomposition that we make in dynamical ejecta versus post-merger ejecta, we take into account what you are uh, suggesting in the post-merger ejecta component. But I, I agree, it's not necessarily, we are not necessarily doing it in a correct way. I don't know, uh, Paolo, do, do you want to, to add something about this? about modeling, I mean, precision, accuracy, not precision, accuracy of, of modeling. So, so, Zvi, what you are saying is made, is even more compounded by the fact that we don't even know the lines. We don't even, we can't even identify the species. So, you are absolutely right. And it's even, in fact, it's even more complicated than what you are saying. All that what I am saying is that this analysis is, uh, you are, at best, you are analyzing, and there is not enough data because of opacity and so on, is the composition and the properties of the material at around one day and later. This is when you observe the, the what I call macronova, and most of the people call kilonova. Uh, but it's it's on one it's on t time scale of one day. The attempt to associate one to one between this observation. And, and what was produced by the neutron star merger by the collision itself may be contaminated. You, your observation, your analysis will be perfectly correct as far as the final product, but the final product might have been influenced by an additional mechanism that happened between the matter, ejection of the matter which took place on a time scale of few seconds and the time of the observation. Yes. This is the only statement that I was yes. making. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So one last question, Miss. Yeah, I want to go back to your like three component modeling again and make sure I understand. Are, are you treating these as completely like independent, separate kilonova models and then just summing up for the emission from the three different components? There is. Uh, um, all of this at this stage is rather heuristic. There is a, a, a certain high significant level of uh, inserting elements by hand. I'm not sure I would exclude. I, I can't speak for Mazaomi because I, I don't know 100% what he has done. I don't know that all of the details, the core details of what he has done. I, I think I can answer that. OK. Right. To, yeah, because you have this, you know, fast moving high opacity component that could affect the slower moving stuff <coughs> that's ejected later in, in principle, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the dynamical ejector is what comes, it's, it's a prompt. It's a prompt event. It's prompt. And then there is this, uh, there is this forming uh, hypermassive neutron star that lives between, I don't know, one millisecond and one second. I don't know. Uh, and that makes a lot of neutrinos, MeV neutrinos. And then there is this neutrino wind, uh, which powers this post-merger extra component. That comes a little bit later. So in a sense, yes, you have to treat them se separately. And how do you do this? Uh, it, it depends on your code how much self-consistency self you apply. At the moment, it's pretty manual. Okay, so let's thanks Elena for the great talk and yeah. answering all the questions. Yeah. Thank you.